and then you close your eyes and you just kiss it and give it so much love and then you smile and let it out the clip we've just seen shows cinematic mastermind david lynch directing the actress who plays senorita dito in twin peaks the return with the fireman senorita dito creates a golden orb of laura palmer sent to earth in response to the first nuclear detonation called trinity which lit up the new mexican desert sky on july 16 1945. This detonation, as Lynch illustrates, introduced to the world many evils, including Bob, who terrorizes and murders Laura through her father. Evil hatches right before our eyes in the form of a grotesque moth frog, which squirms its way through an ajar window and into the mouth of a sleeping girl. Meanwhile, other townsfolk suffer analogous auditory violation, entranced into slumber by repeating words transmitted from a usurped radio station. This the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. According to Lynch, evil is a poison. It infects unsuspecting parties who then spread it to others. Evil and environment are inextricably linked, and I aim to show here how, in his depictions of them, Lynch invites us to ponder the nature of original sin, humanity's heritable, corrupt condition that stemmed from, as the Bible relays, Adam and Eve's disobedience of God. Lynch's films beckon us to see this sickness of human souls, including our own souls, so disturbing that we can't help but wonder, can we ever find our way out of evil's clutches? Is there a way we can receive cleansing and renewal? Lynch envisions the atom bomb as both product and producer of evil. Pointing to the mid-1900s as a time when Americans were laying the groundwork for a disastrous future by way of pollution, medical experiments, and the atom bomb, Lynch has stated, All the problems were there, but it was somehow glossed over. And then the gloss broke, or rotted, and it all came oozing out. The problems that have oozed out of the atom bomb have been especially insidious. Consider, for example, the series of nuclear weapons that the United States detonated at Bikini Atoll between 1946 and 1958. The grisly consequences of these detonations have included the destruction of coral reef biodiversity, displacement of the reef's inhabitants, and horrible health consequences for surrounding islanders, including an alarming increase in cases of cancer, thyroid disease, reproductive issues, and birth defects. The atom bomb epitomizes human pride and corruption. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the so-called father of the atomic bomb, drew explicit parallels between the first nuclear detonation and the myth of Prometheus, the titan credited with giving fire and thus power to mankind. Of his impression of the Trinity explosion, Oppenheimer stated of his team, We thought of the legend of Prometheus, of that deep sense of guilt in man's new powers that reflects his recognition of evil and his long knowledge of it. We knew that it was a new world, but even more, we knew that novelty itself was a very old thing in human life, that all our ways are rooted in it. According to Oppenheimer, humanity has an old tendency to strive for novelty, itself bound up with the knowledge of evil. There are opportunities in life for gaining knowledge and experience. Oppenheimer also evokes here the biblical account of Adam and Eve, who defied God's will and ate from the tree of knowledge. The mushroom cloud has been, time and time again, associated with this infamous tree. St. Augustine offers one of the most convincing accounts of the fall of man, whereby Adam and Eve instated original sin as humanity's defective and heritable condition. According to Augustine, evil is not a creation of God. After all, how could a God who is good create evil? Rather, as Augustine says, evil is a perversion of the will. The first evil act of will, proceeding as it did, all evil works in man, was rather a falling away from the work of God to the will's own works than any one work. And those works were evil because they followed the will's own pattern and not God's. Thus the will itself, of man himself insofar as he was possessed of an evil will, was the evil tree, as it were, that bore the evil fruit that those works represented. Evil comes from the will, bound up with the human body and soul, which God created from nothing. Evil, which stems from the nothingness component of each person's being, is itself a nothing. It is a defect that exists parasitically in humans' natural substance. 
This understanding of evil emerges throughout Lynch's work. His evil characters exhibit a disturbing emptiness, as if eaten away by an infectious evil, which relentlessly searches for new hosts and which manifests itself often through nonsensical, disordered, and delayed speech. For example, in Rabbits, a chilling series of web films, the characters hold dull and disjointed conversations, interspersed with an audience's laughter, which comes illogically in response to nothing funny. These rabbits reappear in Inland Empire, a film which takes the viewer through a series of rabbit holes to see how evil has infiltrated the film industry. The film's end credits fittingly feature a dance number to Nina Simone's Cinnamon, to which vapid-headed women dance in revelry of their own vapid-headed power, and to which vapid-headed men in another formulation of Lynch's archetypal lumberjacks saw apart trees. Many of Lynch's works feature this connection between deforestation and sin. In Blue Velvet, Frank discusses his evil plans inside a mill in the town of Lumberton, a town that thrives on the lumber industry. And in Twin Peaks, Pete Martell discovers Lara's corpse near the sawmill, a center point of the town's socioeconomic corruption. Lynch shows how humans destroy the environment, including its trees, because of the corrupt trees of our nature. Let's take a closer look at Eraserhead, a film that Lynch has called his most spiritual film. Indeed, this film might give us the most explicit depiction of original sin in Lynch's work. In addition to the tree near Henry's bed, we can note another invocation of the biblical tree of knowledge, a photograph of the atom bomb. The photograph's location next to Henry's bed suggests a correlation between the transmission of radioactive particles and of human seed, and an entanglement between the environment and humanity. With its in the industrial world where pipes snake visibly through houses, the film showcases how, just as humans have infected the world with filth from their factories, the factories in turn have placed the filth back into humans. Lynch gives us a close-up look at the transmission of such sickness, taking his viewers through a network of tunnels and holes, revealing the filth that spreads and infects us. An industrial demon, himself sickly, works behind the scenes of Henry's personal tribulations. At the film's beginning, we see this demon pull levers in order to extract a sperm-like entity from Henry's mouth and deposit it into a puddle. This moment likely signifies Henry's impregnation of his soon-to-be wife, Mary X, who gives birth to their monstrous baby. On the night Henry visits the X family's house and learns of his child's birth, we witness a multi-generational affliction. Mary suffers an epileptic fit, her father exhibits a paralytic smile, her mother enters a trance and her grandmother sits catatonically. The baby itself, resembling the sperm-like entity extracted from Henry's mouth, appears in the narrative as abruptly and disturbingly as the malady it later develops, spotted with sores that also cover the skin of the demon. Henry is understandably anxious. Only the lady in the radiator consoles him. In the dance she performs for him, she navigates around the sperm-like creatures that fall around her, before squashing them. She recalls here the Catholic image of the sinless Virgin Mary, who is often depicted crushing the Edenic serpent beneath her feet. While the lady herself is not necessarily a celestial entity, she alone among characters displays mastery over evil parasites. Accordingly, she alone can grant Henry peace, but not before Henry's trial at which the demon appears. The presence of the metal bar that resembles Henry's bed railing, along with the emergence of a tree that bleeds, suggests the status of the trial as an interrogation into Henry's culpability in the transmission of original sin. His head pops off, revealing the demonic baby within, before being turned into erasers. There is perhaps an analogy to be made here between Henry and the notion of God as one who washes away or erases sins from the world. At risk of downplaying the potential gravity of the infanticide, I think the film's final sequence shows Henry at least temporarily successful against sin. The baby's evil nature becomes apparent as it watches Henry with an intelligent malignancy and laughs at him. Henry cuts through the baby's body, from which a filthy substance oozes, an outpouring whose shape resembles the nuclear mushroom cloud, and whose substance likely comprises radioactive fallout. The baby is destroyed, the demon suffers infrastructural malfunction, and, if only for a moment, Henry embraces the lady in the radiator and achieves peace. Blue Velvet also centers on the transmission of original sin. 
Early in the film, Mr. Beaumont suffers a stroke. He falls to the ground where his hose continues to sputter like a stream of urine or semen. This image conveys the communicable capacity of a diseased nature that flows within and among the world's creatures. Beneath the beautiful grass, we watch bugs tear each other apart. Disease exists in every part of the environment. As we descend into the severed ear that the seemingly innocent Jeffrey Beaumont discovers, we come to see how the realm of evil mixes with the world of innocence, before re-emerging near the film's end from Jeffrey's own ear into a world seemingly restored. Going into one ear and out of another, viewers traverse a network of physical and psychological passageways through which evil travels. Dorothy Valens recognizes and becomes infected with this disease. After she and Jeffrey sleep together, she tells him that she has his disease inside her. Such a disease might explain why, in one scene, Dorothy acts like Frank and adopts his expressions, an indication that he, too, has put his disease inside her. Blue Velvet, like most or perhaps all of Lynch's films, shows what men, America, and Hollywood do to women's bodies and psyches. The disease infects men and women alike, but Lynch emphasizes the greater devastation that this disease, laced with misogyny, tends to suffer onto women. Jeffrey painfully awakens to his complicit status in the transmission of this disease. He holds the hat of Dorothy's kidnapped son, highlighting the connection between reproduction and corruption. Later, he cries in remembrance of his hitting Dorothy during sex, along with her telling her son that she loves him. Jeffrey has awakened to the horrors that he harbors within himself, and also to the nature of sex as a vehicle for sin's transmission. Indeed, he is not as innocent as he at first seems. He sneaks into Dorothy's apartment and, instead of informing the police about the abuse he has witnessed, he remains silent. It is only much later and by necessity, after Dorothy appears bruised and stark naked before him, that Jeffrey steps into a seemingly heroic role. An ambulance takes Dorothy to the hospital, out of Jeffrey's and the viewer's sight and he returns to the apartment where he shoots and kills Frank, an act that, in a more conventional film, would signify the purge of evil and the restoration of the good. But this is Lynch, and as the camera takes us out of Jeffrey's ear and into the suburban paradise of his backyard on a sunny afternoon, we cannot forget the previous horrors that the characters themselves seem to forget. The robin perched on the windowsill speaks to Sandy's earlier dream about the return of robins signaling love's re-entrance into the world. Yet something about the robin is off. It's visibly a mechanical robin, and it holds in its beak a bug. While this gesture can suggest the conquest of evil by love, it also suggests that this love-bringing Robin will ingest and transmit evil. Jeffrey and company have the luxury to forget this revealed truth. Meanwhile, Dorothy's anxiety persists. The film's epilogue shows her at last reunited with her son, but her final worried look into the distance, coupled with dubbed audio of her singing the final line of the Blue Velvet song, signals the lingering presence of evil and its inflicted traumas. The final pan to the blue sky signifies not a return of a good and natural order, but instead suggests, through its colored connection to the material Blue Velvet, how humans impose their sickness onto and into the world, exacting a lingering harm to other people and their environment. The sky, after all, teems with radioactive particles and other threatening poisons. Given this pervasion of infectious sin, we might ask, does Lynch posit a way of cleansing? In the Lynchian universe, I think the possibility of redemption has something to do with Laura Palmer. In the Twin Peaks pilot episode, James Hurley made a teenager's sentimental proclamation that Laura was the one. Twenty-five years later, we witness the greater spiritual significance of this claim. We see the creation of Laura Palmer as a direct response to the evil that the Trinity Bomb unleashed into the world. Made from logic and love, the Laura Orb travels down a musical birth canal and into the screen which now shows planet Earth, where she will combat the evil Bob. In an episode in which an evil woodsman asks, got a light? Lynch shows that, yes, people do. It's Laura Palmer. But can we, after all, realize the light that Laura brings? Is this role too much to assume for one person? Laura is, after all, a teenaged girl with deep psychological problems who died at the hands of her father. Moreover, to us viewers, she's a fictional character in a television series and movie. Yet, how can we deny the heartbreaking power she holds over us? How can we not confess our communal attempt to realize her? We witness Cooper guide Laura like Orpheus guides Eurydice, watching her slip from his grasp. Why do we yearn so ardently for her return? 
What is it about her that brings us hope? For me, the answer resides in the pink room scene of Fire Walk With Me. In a sea of debauchery, Laura, upon witnessing her friend Donna succumbing to this evil culture, screams out in horror, pulls her away, and calls forth, Not you. Laura, who has already begun to sense her impending sacrificial status, refuses to let her friend suffer a similar fate. She is willing to sacrifice herself in the place of her friend. How many other people could exhibit this same strength of character and honestly proclaim that they would do the same? Despite suffering years of horrific abuse, Laura, while incredibly complex and not without complications, remains essentially good. Her lingering presence in our hearts reveals that, while evil continues to infect us and destroy us, goodness also floods through us and heals us. While the total realization of this goodness slips from our grasp, Lynch suggests that its secret, forgotten but not lost, is something we still need to allow ourselves to hear. <laughs>